Hi, I'm Dave Enzer, and uh, I'm one of the uh, founders of AAAR, and it's my pleasure today to interview Dr. Suzanne Herring, uh, president of uh, Aerosol Dynamics. Suzanne. Well, thank you, Dave. I've, uh, I've actually known Dave for a long time, uh, back to when I was a postdoc at Caltech, and my uh, I've run uh, Aerosol Dynamics since 1991. First uh, area I'd like to discuss is uh, how did you get started in aerosols? Well, it started with an interest in air pollution. Uh, and why air pollution? Because I grew up in a pristine area in the central coast of California, Monterey County, and I was accustomed to clean air. I went to undergraduate, Santa Cruz, same central coast, clean air. And then I went to graduate school in a city, in a relatively clean city, the city of Seattle, which you know because you also went to graduate school there, as I recall. And I thought the air was polluted. And I thought, if this is clean, I hate to see what dirty is. And something needs to be done about that. And so, but I was studying physics. And so I had this interest in air pollution the whole time I was in graduate school, but I continued my work in physics. And as I was, as I was getting my degree, I thought, well, I want to get a postdoc doing some work in the field of air pollution. And I soon learned that most of the air pollution work has to do, deal with chemistry. I didn't know any chemistry. But I spoke with Robert Charlson at the university. and. He introduced me to the world of aerosol, atmospheric aerosols, and told me, you should go get a postdoctoral fellowship with Sheldon Friedlander at Caltech. And he helped make that possible. And so I went into aerosols because it was the only field in air pollution that needed physics as opposed to chemistry. Well, and I think also uh, I'd comment that Bob Charlson introduced me to aerosols as well. So <laughs> we have something in common. But the, uh, another uh, thing you mentioned is that you started your own company. And why did you start your company? It uh, has been very successful over the years and is very well known in the, in the field. Well, perhaps because I was foolish. Uh, perhaps because I had a vision of wanting to develop aerosol instruments. I felt that the whole aerosol measurement field was a backwater. There was this problem that the big players weren't interested because there were no regulations uh, regarding the chemistry of particles, except for lead. Uh, but basically, it wasn't there. They didn't care what the size of particles were. They just cared about the amount of mass you got on this 8 by 10 filter uh, that was averaged over 24 hours once every six day. And the big advance was to put a PM10 pre-cut on it. Uh, so there was just nothing there. And, but I felt that the field needed better measurements. And if there were better measurements, then maybe there would evolve uh, standards that that it was a catch-22. There were no, there was no standard because there was no measurement technique, and there were no measurement techniques because there was no standard. And I had this idealistic uh, notion that I might contribute to breaking that cycle. Well, I think your company has been remarkable. Once you remark, uh, mentioned to me that you had no debt, you basically self-financed and, and again started a very successful small business. Well, it's no debt because it stayed small. <laughs> well, I think that uh, another part uh, of, of your career that I found really uh, of high interest was the development of the water-based condensation particle counter. I know that when I saw your first poster at a quick I stared at it for about 15 minutes trying to understand how it actually worked. And I, th I think it's still quite remarkable uh, development oh. and invention. Oh, well, well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's kind of backwards. I mean, people think if you're going to condense something, you have to make it cold. And so you have all these alcohol uh, condensation particle counters that work by 
saturating the, the flow with the alcohol and passing it through a cold wall condenser. And that's, uh, and if you do that with water, it doesn't work very well because water diffuses so quickly, you just end up flooding the walls with water. Uh, and you get some supersaturation, but not very much. And so, but what gave me the idea? And, and it was a, uh, at the AAAR meeting again in 2001 in Portland, Oregon. And Sheldon Friedlander came to me and said, Suzanne, we have to have a way to measure particle bound peroxide. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is not an easy problem because the peroxide partition between the gas and the particle, depending upon how much water is in the aerosol and how much water is there, depends on how you sample the stuff. And it's going to change over time. And so I thought, well, let's make a denuder that represents the human lung so that you're sampling at a known relative humidity that's representative. So I started reading about the human lung. And I thought, oh, I need somebody uh, on this team who knows about modeling the human lung. And I talked to Tony Wexler. And he pointed out that you get supersaturation in the human lung if you inhale air on a cold day, you have this cold air passing through these warm, wet walled tubes of your lung. And this creates a supersaturation. And bingo, that was it. Uh, I thought, oh, so the human lung is the condensation particle counter based on water that everybody's always wanted. Well, I put down the phone after talking to Tony, and I literally ran across the office. And I asked Mark Stoltenberg if he would put this concept into his CPC model. Did it really work? And about two hours later, Mark emerges from his office. And, said, and Mark, who would always doubt any of my crazy ideas, came out and said, I think this really works. And furthermore, he says, look how sharp the cut points are. And look at how small you can see with water. Well, that's your eureka moment. That was it. And we filed for the patent within, or at least the preliminary patent, based on those calculations within two weeks. So, yeah. So it was just hearing about something, applying it to a known aerosol measurement problem, and having Mark there to do the calculations to say whether or not it was really feasible. It all came together. It all came together. Well, I think the thing is also remarkable that the instrument was commercialized very rapidly. Yes. I think that's a story in itself, how you were able to uh, uh, move very quickly from discovery to a fielded instrument. Yes. Well, that preliminary patent was filed in January of 2002. And the uh, first commercial instrument was shown at AAAR in 2000. Three, October of 2003. And it happened because we just immediately sought a licensee. And there were these people forming a new company. They needed an instrument. I actually went to Pat Cady, and I, she was talking about forming an aerosol instrumentation company. And I, this was in the end of January. And I said, oh, Pat, do I have the instrument for you? And then I had to correct myself and say, well, it's just, it's just alphaware. In other words, it's just an idea. We haven't done this yet, but we think it's going to work. And so uh, that was, so I kind of offered it to Pat as her instrument to start a company with. Well, she ended up not starting a company because she moved from Minneapolis to Colorado. But the company did start, and it was, under the direction of Fred Quant and Fred and his engineer, Derek Oberright, took our calculations, or I should say more correctly, Mark's calculations. And from those calculations, they built the very first condensation particle counter based on laminar flow with water. And that instrument is down in the history exhibit uh, this, this week, along with the poster that you stared at in 2003. <laughs> and 
But we had, in all fairness, we had actually also tested that the condensational growth worked. But we had done it uh, applying the condensational growth as a collector rather than as a uh, particle counter because I knew how to do particle collection and I wasn't an optics person. So that's, uh, but it was a, a young, another young company startup and they, they built that instrument in six months. Uh, they got the license in around January or February of 2003 and by the end of June they brought a fully operational prototype to me at aerosol dynamics and we tested it out so yes it was very fast well I had a, and it was fun I recall a story where there was a proof of concept where they're using a laser particle counter and a metal by a laser pointer Derek did that they uh, in all fairness, they said, before they licensed this crazy idea, they took a cold flow through a warm wet wall tube and they stared at the output with a laser counter, laser pointer. So they actually did that and then they didn't confess it for a while because, <laughs> <laughs> but it was only fair. Well, I, I think also, you know, Pat is still working with you. She is indeed. And you started another company. That's correct. And tell, tell us something about the other company. Application had been not the particle counting, but the particle collection. And I had felt for a long, long time that there was a real utility to making uh, counting or collecting particles in a very small area. I mean, often the analytical techniques don't need all that sample you get on the filter. They're just extracting a small portion of that sample for your for your HPLC or your gas chromatography or sometimes for uh, x-ray fluorescence analysis. And with the low pressure impactor, I had specialized in making small spots at low flow rate. And so our sampler, the spot sampler, does exactly that, except instead of having the, the bounce problems that you have with an impactor, you have uh, no bounce because the, the, it's droplets that are collecting. Uh, and because you've enlarged these ultra-fine you know, nanometer-sized particles, we can get really efficient collection down to five nanometers really, really easily. What so, a development. Yeah. There's actually a further development in that instrument, and that is the three-stage concept, the one we call chocolate. Uh, and this is a concept that was developed by Steve Spielman in our office. Uh, and chocolate is his name, too, by the way. And it stands for cold, hot, cold. And because instead of just going cold and hot, which we did in the, the first condensation particle counters, we discovered that if you go cold and then just hot for a short distance, and then follow it with something cold again, that your saturation profiles, that extent of supersaturation, doesn't change much in that subsequent cold section than if you just kept the whole thing hot. But you have the advantage that your output flow is at a reasonable temperature and a reasonable dew point. So you're not having to deal with a ton of water vapor and you can collect your sample dry at ambient temperature. And so this was a, a development from the collector and that's what's in the little new uh, aerosol collector that I'm now selling in conjunction with Pat Kay. One thing I think that might be interesting that could be is your involvement in AAAR in the early oh. days. Oh. I think you were involved in the very beginning, I, including a uh, short course at UCLA where you yeah. were kind of involved in the peripheral. But we had a discussion at that conference about should we start an aerosol society? Yeah. I don't remember that conversation per se. Uh, what I do know is that I've always been an organizer of things. And the first aerosol conference was organized uh, through the office at UCLA where I worked. Uh, and it was in Santa Monica. And I just stepped up and started doing things that needed to be done. It was kind of that simple. I didn't have an official role. but. 
I remember saying, okay, I'm going to put together uh, a roster of everyone who's registered. I uh, made sure that the abstracts are handled, and they kind of came, all came across my desk. And that's how I know that the very first two abstracts submitted to a AAAR conference were submitted by Dave Sinclair. Right. Uh, it's because of my involvement. And so for a long time, I was involved in being the, the kind of the memory, the conference memory for the organization. And I, was, I helped organize, oh, about the first 10 years of conferences, I believe, until AAAR established itself with a, an official organization for, for taking over those activities. Uh, so I ran the 92 conference out of my office in, in Berkeley. That was the San Francisco meeting. Yeah. I found venues for the 94 meeting. Uh, I worked with uh, the people running the meeting in uh, Reno, I think, in, in Traverse City the years before that. So organized tutorials for the Seattle meeting. I did a number of things. Well, I think you're unusual in AAAR that you've served the president twice. And I recruited you. On the first ballot. <laughs> you recruited me the first time. And, and then uh, the second time was under sad circumstances because we had lost Glenn Cass. And they asked for somebody to step in. And I uh, frankly felt that having had the experience the first time, I could do a better job the second time. So <laughs> it was an interesting time for AAAR because I was in the position of negotiating a uh, a management contract for the organization, uh, negotiating an entire new uh, uh, contract with Taylor and Francis, our, our publisher. That's when we got the uh, open access after one year. I'm the one that put forth that request. And they said, oh, OK. <laughs> they were great. And there was something else that I did that year. Oh, there was also looking for a new editor. Or that transition had just happened. And I helped facilitate the transition. Which transition was that, the that was between Phil Hoppe and Rick Flagan. Okay. And I just got the two of them to meet together and to help facilitate that transition. So but they would have done it on their own. I don't know that they needed me. Um, maybe one other thing that's interesting, you might fit this in your comments somehow, but is in the 80s, I ran a lot of large field studies. And these were in the LA Basin. And we yeah. prepared measurement methods for particulate nitrate and nitric acid in the atmosphere. We compared measurement, in another study, we compared measurement methods for the acidity of fog. Uh, in a third study, we compared measurement methods for carbonaceous aerosols, because no one knew how to measure these things. Right. And as the project manager, I didn't have any control over how people were funded, but it was my job to put together the protocol and to get everyone to just agree to it. And people did. And we got some very interesting results. And I got to see firsthand all these instruments, because I had to write up a description about each measurement method that was in the study. So I got this personal tour. Uh, personal tour from all the, the scientists about what they're doing. And, and it was great. So I learned a lot just uh, in running those field studies about the world of aerosol instrumentation. Yeah, I, one thing I've often wondered, and that you may be in a unique position to answer this. I mean, you grew up with AAAR, and you grew up with the air pollution particle field. Where do you see that? things may be going. Have you, have you thought about that? Well, I think the climate change issues are going to become more and more on the, on the more and more important. Uh, and that involves knowing more about atmospheric particles. I think there, beyond that, there are going to be uh, issues with uh, particles, airborne particles from nano fabricated materials that uh, could be a potential health issue that's, that's being 
kind of ignored right now. Uh, and, um, I think the third thing that will emerge but hasn't emerged as much as it should have because of a lack of uh, a home uh, is the indoor air quality problem. And that has been looked upon mostly as a gas phase problem, but it's also a particle problem. Right. And after all, people spend most of their time indoors. So I think those are three areas that involve aerosol research uh, that, and air quality that will be emerging. And then on top of that, there's the whole field of using uh, aerosol methods to generate new materials. The other side of nanomaterial fabrication is actually producing these things. Uh, and that could uh, enable you know, more efficient solar panels and tools that we need to combat global warming. Uh, and also perhaps tools that we need to fight the environmental problems that come from nanofabricated materials. It's kind of an interesting uh, tie. What, what three areas in your career are you most excited about and, and, and you're the proudest of Three things. Well, I'm certainly proud of the water condensation particle counter, or just the laminar flow water growth, and its application, not just the particle counting, but the particle collection to improving the charging efficiency of small particles, to being able to focus them, so that we can now uh, by combining the focusing and the charging, we can now increase the efficiency of placing a low level of charge on 10 nanometer particles 40-fold from what you get from bipolar charging. Uh, so, and the particle collection, I think, has a lot of applications. And so the water condensation technology is certainly one of the things of which I am most proud. Uh, another thing I'm very proud of is, I'm very pleased with, is having developed the, uh, in collaboration with Alan Goldstein, the thermal desorption aerosol gas chromatographic methods for uh, in situ measurements of the chemical composition of organic aerosols. This is not a water condensation method, but it's what we call TAG. And uh, working with Alan over the last dozen years now, has been a very rewarding experience and has led to all kinds of advances and now quantitative measurements, hourly timelines of hundreds of organic compounds of interest in trying to under, unravel the problem of secondary organic aerosol formation. And so having been able to make that happen, that work is mostly being carried by others now, yeah. by Nathan Kreisberg and our group, and really advanced by Gabriel Isaacman uh, and Alan's group. And, really carried forth by Alan's, Alan Goldstein's uh, vision of what this means. Uh, I'm proud of the work I've done for AAAR, just the volunteer work for AAAR. And I'm, uh, I think the other thing is just being able to start and run a small business. I mean, lots of people do that. My business is a little bit unique, and we're kind of straddled between the academic world and the commercial world. We are that liaison between the ideas in academia and making them practical enough that they can then be handed over to a licensee. Um, so our collaborations with universities throughout the country uh, have been very rewarding and has put us in a rather unique position. Oh, good. Well, again, thank you. Appreciate the chance to uh, have a chat with you. Well, thank you, Dave. Okay.